What's up, mother suckers? This is your African king of comedy, Michael Blackson. If you have not subscribed to Real Life Street Star, get your life together. Subscribe right now. Push the button. Shut up. Don't look at me. Everybody start clapping right now. We got a legend in the building. Michael Blackson in the building. What's up, brother? Yeah, when they gonna finish your ceiling? <laughs> I'm just fucking with y'all. Yeah. Shit, it's nice you know, here, man. Do you think we getting ripped off? We paying like 4,600. Just for this one room? No. <laughs> oh, nice. I mean, you downtown Dallas, man. Everything is expensive now. Everybody trying to move out here to Dallas, so. You gonna you know, move out here? Would you move hey, out to I Dallas? Would, I would definitely move out here to Dallas. Dallas almost in the middle of the country, and <laughs> you could pretty much you live here. You like three hours from everywhere. That's three hours from New York. Three hours, less than three hours to New York, L.A., Philly, D.C. So this is a this is a good central area for a comedian for real. If you really think about it, it's not a bad idea. What about the the scene though? I don't know as good as travel, but like. I mean, it's great. You know, I come here. I've been coming here for a very long time, um, and I love it here. It's a great mix of raising a family and turning up at the same time, and being relaxed and chill. You know, I mean, you never know. To you. go to go to Kansas City, you'll run right back here, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just Dallas is one of the places that is definitely on on the up and rise. So y'all, y'all got a good place here to live. Would you say you know when COVID happened, it seemed like comedians was finding their creative ways to kind of get they, they shit off. Is it, do you feel like you're back? Yeah, we back. We been back. <clears throat> we back. I mean, I was doing all kinds of shit when COVID happened. I was t- Titty Tuesday, twerking Thursdays. I was on like live strip shows on my IG live. It was crazy. It's wherever to make some money. And then the comedy clubs hit us up like, I, when COVID happened, I thought it was over for live entertainment. I really thought it was over. I'm over. I went to my bank account. I'm like, okay, I got this amount of money left. If I just spend this amount of day, I could live for 30 years, and I better die after 30 years, motherfucker. <laughs> because then I'm gonna be homeless if I'm not dead. So, but then three months later, it's like, yeah, I want to go back to work. I'm like, yes. And then I was ready to go back. And then I was, thought about. It, I'm like, I'm not ready because I forgot my shit. We stay home for three months. I for, and then you gotta go write new shit on COVID. So I'm like, I need 30 more days, uh, 30 days, I just put some shit together. And then I started going back. In fact, my first place when I went back, it was in July, um, July I went to um, Memphis was first. And after that was all into improv, was the second place. <laughs> so by, Memphis was like the guinea pig. And by the time I got to all in thing, I got my shit back together. And then was back rolling. Man, I went to see your show. Boy, you were funny as Hell in person, bro. I appreciate I, that, man. I've oh. been putting work for a long time, man. man. Greatness don't happen overnight. I just saw a skit where you just did the 40 meter dash. Yeah. <laughs> in one second, 20, 1.28 <laughs> seconds, what the fuck? I'm gangster, nigga. I've been, I've been chased by lions my whole life, nigga. You, so, not, huh? so if you and Cat Williams were in a race, who would win? I'm probably win, man. <laughs> I whooped that nigga's ass. I went. <laughs> His perm, his dreadlock gonna hold him back, man. <laughs> you know, um, I don't, he, I mean, everybody could run, nigga. 40 yard dash, and you, your fat ass could probably do it too. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> you just make him, every week they can make a video of him run. Nigga, stop running. Uh, you just the fuck out of here. Anybody could run. We could all run. Man, you, you've been a part of a lot of legendary things, man. Um, I wanna touch right now on the state of comedy. Yeah. Right, because with that, the Cat Williams did sixty-one some million views. Right, mm-hmm. we've never seen them type of views. Never. And yeah. then it seems like all the outrage from the comedians came about. And yeah. you were probably one of the most vocal people. You know what I'm saying? As far as the interview, you don't like what's going on. When you first seen that interview and you saw the effects that it was having on the comedy world, I think it it peered back a layer that we didn't even know was going on. Yeah. Has it always been that volatile with comedians? Nah, you know, I mean. The, the kind of like, you know, as you get older, man, you just start to express yourself more. That's what that's all about. You know, Cat is getting older, Moni getting older, everybody getting older, they feel like they've been, they've been fucked over, now it's time to speak their mind, you know. And there's nothing wrong with speaking your mind. You just don't, I don't think just wise to tear the niggas down in the process. 
you know, and it was great for comedy because when it happened, everybody started looking up comedy shit, Googling shit up, finding this shit out, you know. But I thought that everybody he talked bad about, I thought he had personal issues with them. You know, I knew he had a personal issue with me. I, I knew that was coming. <laughs> but, see, but, see, that, but that confused me because I seen y'all on so many things together. You know, you yeah. said Friday After Next, Wildin' Out, Repo. Repo. Yeah. Y'all got well, mad moves. Well, Wildin' Out time, we wasn't really fucking with each other. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was uh, me and Kev was really cool. Like, really, was really cool. Like, we have huge respect for each other. Till I did an interview with Drink Champ. And I was—I thought I was giving the nigga a compliment, but I guess it came up wrong, and he took it personal. You saw the interview. You know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, so the, no, no. I said I was talking about. I said Cat is probably the most lovable comedian on earth. I don't give a fuck how much crack y'all think that nigga smoked. Right. right, right. <laughs> but even even Noriega didn't even look at it as an insult. Nobody paid attention to it. Right. You know, some some punk bitch told the nigga, I might just call you a crackhead, and he just he even. He just looked at, you know, he probably just saw that part, didn't even read the rest of the part, and then he got mad about it. So when he got mad, he started putting up subliminal messages on my comments on my page. I'm like, this nigga mad about it. I'm like, I didn't even mean it in a bad way. I'm trying to give you a compliment. And I'm a comedian. Even my compliment's gonna have some kind of joke to it. Right. That's what we do. But, you know, he probably took it personal. Maybe he do some more crack. I don't fucking know. I know if a nigga call me a crackhead, I don't do crack, I'm not gonna get mad. Have you ever done any hard drugs ever? Never. I, I, I did get high once by accident, uh, and it happened in Africa. And I was hanging out with my boy, uh, Fuse ODG, he had, he had, um, um Afrobeat star from England, but he's from Ghana. And I was at his house in Ghana, and he, you know, he had this little drink. And I tasted him, I'm like, that drink sweet, it's good. Cause I'm, I'm not a drink, I'm not really a big time drinker, I don't smoke, I don't do none of that stuff. And I'm like, this drink was so sweet. I'm like, that shit good. Let me get more. He said, Mike, calm down. That shit got some, some, you know, weed, whatever is in it. I don't, I'm like, there's no way this shit gonna make me high. This shit tastes too good. <laughs> man, I kept drinking it, man. Two hours later, I saw 1982, motherfucker. Everything that happened to me in 1982 started coming back. <laughs> man, I went to my room. I started folding clothes. I was paranoid. I'm like, oh my God, let this fucking feeling go away. I had to sleep that shit up. I woke up, I'm like, thank you, Lord, I got my life back together. I ain't never getting high no more. I was done. So that's as high as, that's, that's probably as hard as I ever got. Um, do you feel like this comedy shit is turning to like street shit? Yeah, I got a gun on me right now, I'm gonna shoot all y'all niggas. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that, man. It's, these niggas ain't doing nothing. Mike ass ain't going to beat up no Shannon Sharp. <laughs> <laughs> you going to talk about doing no fighting. Ain't none of it. You know, Mike had a special coming out. He was promoting special. You know, <laughs> Cat Williams was trying to go on tour, and that's why he did all that shit. But you went, I'm, you know, I, they, I'm not sure. Did y'all go see the show yet? Because he was here. No, I saw yours. Hmm? I just went to see yours. No, I appreciate that. Yeah. Now, I mean, he was here two nights. Right. I don't, I'm, I'm curious to know what he's talking about, because... I'm hoping he's picking back up what he did. And there's nothing wrong. Go on stage, clown the comedian. That's all good. There's nothing wrong with that. I only had a problem with him like doing shit to like kill other comedians' career. That's bad. Right. When you go up there and say Cedric is a joke thief, it's I'm like, first of all, no, no. Stealing jokes is the biggest thing you could do to a comedian. We ready to like shoot you, fight you, whatever. Because gotcha. you know, it's hard to come up with brilliant material. Right. But you, if you look at that joke that they're talking about, so many guys have done something similar to it. You know what I mean? J.B. Smooth, probably was the first one I remember. Mm -hmm. You know, Stadrick, all that shit about getting a car, playing the music, you know, that shit is, is stock. You mean, in comedy, we have jokes and you have stock joke. Uh, or certain roast is a stock. When there's a stock joke, that means everybody could use it. And that idea is a stock idea. So to come up with, to, to wait 25 years later and, you know, and and go degrade Cedric Entertainer, who is like a comedy legend. You know, like, like we all trying, like we all are, you know, he's a TV star now. And how, how are his fans supposed to feel about that? You gonna say this nigga still jokes. How, how are you gonna buy tickets to see Cedric if you think he's a joke thief? You doing shit to fuck up his career. That wasn't cool. Go Rose, make fun of nigga. The fat joke about him looking like a whatever, that was funny. Right. You know, but don't go and, Degrade, set to my Ricky Smiley. 
I put a contact, put a dress on. What was that for? Now, how am I going to feel come to go and buy Ricky's smart ticket if he put on a dress? You know, certain things you don't do. Make the joke, you know what I mean? You know, um, then he mentioned Michael Blackson. He said comedians don't get booed enough. That's how he ended up with Michael Blackson. You mad at me because I don't get booed because I go up there and I work very hard every day. You know, he went a whole year where he got booed for like on tour. He got booed everywhere. <clears throat> I don't know what the nigga smoked, what he ate, what he did, whatever he did. Nigga was fucked up. I seen it with my own eyes. And even with that, it was a, it was stress. He was going, whatever he was going through with drugs and shit. We just, we still respect him. We still love him. You know, that was probably his crackhead era. I don't know what that. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. He said never did no hard drug, but look on YouTube. Look up Cat Williams on stage on crack. Put it in there. <laughs> so you know, he did some shit that was like hurting people's career. You know what I mean? So, but whatever it is, it would, it's kind of good for comedy because it made people start looking people up, you know. But it, it, I'm not sure, it didn't help. It ain't helping Ricky, it helping Cedric. You know, I, I'm not selling more shows because of that. I've been selling shows out. But know? did it go up? Did it go even crazy? Because I'm sure, you well, know. The only, now, honestly, the, probably the mm -hmm. only one that, that probably benefited from this is him, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, fucking Shannon Sharp. handicapped Shandy Sharp. Shannon Sharp. And I was gonna ask you about He walked like he's handicapped, motherfucker. <laughs> so like, so like, why why oh. is so much blowback coming to Shannon Sharp? Like you you, you got DL Hughley, Colin and Messi. <laughs> y'all y'all are killing Shannon. But do y'all feel you know some what? type of way I, about Shannon? He said what? Do y'all feel some way about no, Shannon? No, no, no. We, we love, honestly we love Shannon. It's just that he was, you know, some. Kame just felt like, you know, he was just, what he was doing was bringing negativity to black people. You know what I mean? You bring guys out here. Because here's the thing with interviews. Certain, certain interviews, especially on a big platform, and it, you, think, you feel like a person going up that line and, and saying things they shouldn't be saying, like, edit this shit out. That's what it felt like. You know, but we in the podcast era. There's a whole new era, and everybody trying to go viral. So the crazy thing niggas say is what you, niggas were looking to post. And it worked. They get 62 million views, whatever. He made a whole lot of fucking money. And, you know, but in the process of it, you know, he tore people down because the only, he, he the only one that had the final control over it. You know, you could have been like, you know what, let me, because if you, if you can't get confirmation, you know, if the nigga saying something, you got to talk to the other guy first. You know, get, find out if it's true before you put it out. You know what I mean? So now, he putting shit out, and, and now other comedians now knew we roasting his ass because he putting this shit out. You know, you should have edited that shit out, cut <laughs> that sh lies out, nigga. How you feel about Shannon Sharp going viral for the, the outfit that he had on? Uh, oh, man. Hey, <laughs> 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 nigga, I trying to get me knocked out by a big nigga. Fuck you, <laughs> <laughs> But you know, the thing about everybody had every, at least 10% of people have a weird walk. That's this weird ass walk. What is born with it? Whether you got a chromosome missing, I don't fucking know, man. I'm not, you know, I'm not fucking with Shannon. You know, I'm, a, I'm a football fan, and I, of course, I was a fan of him being a, one of the greatest tight end. And I just hope he's just, just a tight end. Like, for God, for God. Pause. Not a loose end. I'm just saying. <laughs> Nah, what, but I ain't, I, don't, I don't know shit about what's going on with Shannon Sharp. What, uh, when you got into comedy, were you naturally funny or did you have to develop your style? I think it's easier when you're naturally funny. I mm -hmm. think I was. And I, I didn't, I have, I was working at that moment. I was just uh, 20 years old working at Domino's Pizza and my friends thought I was funny. They're like, you funny, man, go to open mic. I said, what the fuck is that? Is they just go sign up in a comedy club and you just go on stage and that's how I started going. So somebody thought I was funny and that's why, I, you know. So you got, it's easier when you're naturally funny than trying to, you know, because you go to comedy school, you know, you go to comedy school, yeah, yeah, the comedy schools out there, you can learn how to, you know, deliver a joke and your presence on stage. But it's a lot easier when you, it's a given talent from God. You know what I'm saying? Um, what do you think about the Friday curse? You heard of that? No. That everybody from Friday, next yeah. Friday passed and stuff like that? Uh, let me see. I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of people died from that movie. I mean, I don't look at it as a curse. Let's go back. Let's see Friday. Man, we lost a lot. At we least, what? Five? Is five of them or six? Uh, Let's start. Yeah. Give me the names. 
And then uh, let's see what happened to that. Well, I don't know. I know the yeah. I know the the Friday names. Pops. Okay. Pops. I mean. Yeah. Tiny. Pops. Tiny. Yeah. That something was so surprising. Some you know like Zoo, the Tiny. Of course, Brandy Mac. You know. Uh, I mean, I'm not sure. I'm always gonna say it's a, it was, you know, it's a curse. It's just that you know, Ice Cube was brilliant, and he got the, he got the popness comedians and put them in one place. How yeah. was he? That, what I was gonna ask is, how was he able to do it back then? Because it seemed like you know, you hear people now saying, "Man, I only got a thousand dollars for the to depart," but it seemed like he was able just to put y'all together, and he got the most talented roster. It seemed like as far as a, a, a independent movie. You know, but people keep saying Ice Cube did. I, but you know, when you do any job, it's your first time. Every job has a minimum wage. You know, what I mean, his job is just to put this cast together, and then he got now his guys to go to payroll. You know, and, and there's a minimum wage for everything. You know, back then we talking about like '95. I'm not sure there was when I did it in '99 because it came out in 2000. Minimum wage was $800 a day for like a speaking role. You know, and I worked overtime, so I did like an extra couple of hours and made like twelve hundred dollars. And then when the movie come out, you probably I probably made me another couple of thousand. You know, I had, I had a very limited role. But what did it do for me? It took me from making five hundred dollars a show to twenty five hundred dollars a show. You know, and then keep going up, keep going up, and then I think I was one point stopped at like five thousand. And then probably one time got to 10,000. And then when social media came out and I made a presence there and then boom, shot up to like as high as it could go. So, you That's know, that, yeah, yeah. So, you can, I mean, we, those who complain it make no sense because that movie put all of them on the map, you know, and every movie there's a budget. And then, you know, and you're new. It's, it was Chris Tucker's first movie. What do you, what do you think they're going to pay you for your first time doing anything? So the second time is when, you know, they, the second time they want they want you back, then they gotta give you a certain amount of money. Yeah. You know, same thing like me the when I did Meet the Blacks, the first one, you know, they, 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 I worked a whole week for like one, one or two weeks for like 10 grand. You know, when they did a part two, I'm like, oh no, buddy, I need some money. <laughs> Because that means for you to do a part two, that means you made some money in part one. Right, right. Now, for real. So now I need like a huge amount of money and then I need like a percentage of whatever. Right. And they paid it, you know. So so do y'all at this point, like, you know, you being in the career, you know, back in the day, Comic View, we were just discussing this. Comic View was like our outlet to find all these dope comedians, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Or you had, you know, um, the other one. So That's now true. do you feel like, um, social media helped you propel because you just stayed relevant through it all yeah. somehow. And we were like, damn, you you stay so relevant. You know what I mean? Do you feel like the social media is the biggest part that well, plays Well, right now it? it is. I mean, because I remember when I came out, I, of course, Comedy View was my, my first break, of course. And then uh, when Next Friday came out, it kind of helped because, see, with, with us, our audience, we like to connect things. So when next Friday came out, they'd be like, oh, that's an African nigga from Comic View. Well, you know, I went, because I when it came out, I went, got me a ticket, went to the theater, sat in the back yeah. and watched how people react to it. Like, oh, that's an African nigga from, the, from Comic View. So I'm like, is it a connected Comic View to that? You know, and I remember, and Mike Epps, he didn't even do like, maybe he might have did one episode of Comic View prior to next Friday. Because I sat back and I watched how they reacted to Mike Epps the first time on the screen. And they were very judgmental. Like, who is this nigga taking Chris, Chris, Chris Tucker's spot? You know what I mean? So Mike, you know, they, they, had, he had to, they had to earn his love. You know what I mean? He had to earn the love from the people. And I sat and watched it. And, you know, early in the movie, it was kind of slow. And then, you know, Mike didn't really, like, wake up to, like, that whole scene where, like, the girl, when the, when the girl came, Baby D came and then he started yeah. going in. He's talking about the snacks. She be sleeping and not even be snoring. She be snoring, not even be sleep. But that's <laughs> yeah. That's when like they're waking up to Mike and then boom, he just took it from there. Did you freestyle that line? I'm just a oh, bitch yeah. ass nigga. Yeah, <laughs> Did yeah. you freestyle? So the, yeah, I freestyle that. So the movie, um, I mean, in fact, the funny thing about next Friday when we did it, after it was shot and edited, you know, we had like a um a screening for the actors and the directors. And I watched it, I'm like, what the fuck? I'm like, we did so much funnier things. I didn't even like what I, what I did. Because we did, me and Mike S freestyled at home. We had all kind of crazy. Like, I wish I could find the stuff they edited out. 
20 times funnier than what we did. And the only reason why, the only reason why it came out that way because 90% of the time, the nigga that's editing the movie was not on set. Oh, they yeah. get this nigga the footage, just go edit it. And the editor's job, every editor is trying to get an Oscar. They're trying to win something. So you got to get the best angle, the best this, the best that. So the nigga just picked the parts that had the best angles for him. You know, and because I'm... Was hilarious, <laughs> but you know, I didn't like it till I went, sat back and watched people react to it. And then I felt <laughs> better about it. And the only thing that was in the script that we said was, I can't get jiggy with this shit. Everything else that we did was ad lib. Yeah. You know, me and Mike Epps, because at that moment, we've known each other for about, it's just like 99. We started about the same time. He might start at like 93, I was probably like 94. So we've known each other for like five, six years. Comedians, we all like, we're all family. We all know each other. You know, we all came across each other, whether it's like an audition, whether it's a competition, whether it's like, a, you know, on set of like a Dev Jam, on set of a comedy view. We've been seeing each other faces. So we familiar with each other. And Mike was in um, New York. I know he left Indy, went to New York, and I was in Philly. So, you know, he'll come to Philly and do a show. He stay at my house. You know, we'll go to we'll go do a show in New York. We see other comedians out. We're like one family and we known each other. We every time we get together, it's a roast fest. So when we get on set, we just continue that same shit. So we just ad lib the whole fucking movie. Did you ever get tired of people coming up to you saying, I can't get you with this shit? Like, yeah. how, how often did you have to? Every day. And the funny thing about it, I'll be in the airport and I have my fans mm-hmm. pull up and all oh, white people don't know who I am, right? If you a, a nigga put up to me like, hey, you black bitch, what the fuck are the white man like, my God, why is he insulting that guy? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus, do you, are you okay, sir? You want to call the cops? This guy just called you. Uh, yeah, I'm like, no, nah, it's okay. You know, that's how my fans show me love. You black bitch, you ugly nigga, fuck you, punk bitch. I'm like, I love you too, motherfucker. Now, you've always been very good about like taking, like when people score you or post pictures, yeah. you always repost it. Yeah. Like, does that not fuck with you? Like, and at a certain point, it's like, all right, motherfucker, this is how, this oh, how no, God I'm made not. me. No, you know what? I'm like, I'm. The fans are who got me where I am. So I, every chance I get, man, I show them love. I'm, you know, it's hard for me to say no to a picture unless I'm running to catch my flight and I'm running late. I'm like, man, you got to get me another time. But if, without the fans, man, you know, I wish every entertainer felt that way. Like, without the fans, you ain't shit. You know what I mean? So every time, you know, whatever it is, whatever they got to say to remember who you are, those are my lines and that's what, Made me who I am. So if they want to repeat it, keep repeating it. Yeah. You know, don't matter. Now, I, I got to ask, this is a personal question, man. I, I watched it a uh, couple's retreat. Yeah. And I seen you on there. And you had it set up to where every dude was jealous because yeah. you had it set up to where you could still sleep with other women. And niggas was like, how do you pull that off? So I just want to know, man, man, how did you pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> you got to pull that shit off early at the beginning of the relationship. You can't be five years in, two kids in here. Can I get some side bitches? <laughs> no. You gotta do that shit from day one. Bro. You know, when I got with when I got with Ryder, it was I had been um just got out of like a four-year relationship. I've been single for like eight, nine months, living my best life. And then when I became single is when I realized, damn it, I can't be faithful. My dick ain't made for one person. You know, I finally realized that because in the past, I just lie and cheat and lie and sneak and do all that. And then when I finally became single, I'm like, okay, I got some money. I got a nice house. I got a nice car. Like, why am I going to lie to? Why am I lying for? Who am I lying to? Like, why? Why don't I just be me? Live your truth. And I'm like, man, I, I just said, I'm here, I had like three, two, three, four chicks. I'm, I get with something. I put them all together, you know, and I was a good time. And then when she came in my life, you know, she kind of like, um, uh, she was a little different because I felt like, you know, every other girl that I was seeing, like if I'm taking a trip, I had to fly her out and I do this. And when, when she get my life, you know, she's scamming to me because she'll fly herself and take me to expensive dinner. Mm. Do all that shit that I wasn't getting from. Oh, she reversed it. Yeah, she reversed it. She tricked me. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck are you got me? She did all that. Now I'm spending the money. Punk bitch. <laughs> I'll see you in court, motherfucker. 
Yeah, she got me real good. But, you know, I, it was turned on to me because I am i wasn't used to that. I'm used to, like, got a fly chicken. She's like, fly herself in, take me to dinner, you know, nothing. You know, and then also, you know, men at the end of the day, men want to be treated like a baby. You know, we like babies forever. She, like, she, she you know, she come and do things, cook, clean up. Just made me feel like a king, you know. And then she was trying to lure me in, you know. And um, when I when we got to the point where she was trying to lure me, I said, "Listen, I mean, it's all great and good, but I can't be with one person. So if you're okay with me, you know, sticking my dick here and there, this will work." <laughs> you know. And then we had to put some. <laughs> Yeah, but you gotta do that from the beginning. You got, you got. If, but I'm, hold up. I know you can't be an average nigga. You can't be broke and do this. You, know? <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you can't even afford your own girl. How you gonna cheat? Right. Every watching was a cheaters nigga bringing a bitch to the crib. How you gonna bring cheat at your house, nigga? You can't even afford a hundred hour hotel. It's, you gotta be different. You gotta be able to afford it. Cheating is not for broke niggas, please. Sir. If you're broke, <laughs> just be faithful, motherfucker. Okay. Yeah, but it's not for the average person. You gotta. It's, it's. But if you don't feel like you're an average nigga, when you meet a girl here, you know, I like, and women just want honesty. I guarantee you 50% of them will say yes if y'all come to some kind of term, and as long as you're not being disrespected, you know. I'm one of those women who agree, right? So. <laughs> you You can sign my side chick list, motherfucker. Hey. <laughs> oh, that's your nigga. Okay, that's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you. Um, so, so I agree. Okay. Um, I feel like a man of a certain stature should not be tied to one piece of ass for the rest okay, of their life. That just seems you. ridiculous, right? I live a great life, by the way, so <laughs> it paid off. Nice. But are there, with you and your lady, previous or current, are there any set of rules like, hey, like, you know, don't bring them here. Don't you know? Don't do this. Stay within these guidelines, or is it kind of? Well, just I mean, a we free still going through the rules. She, she, you know, she, um, <laughs> she don't like me. She want me to like, you know, she want me to. She want me to just stick with one person because then feelings on big. You gonna start catching feelings. She actually want me to have two at the same time. That way, if you got two girls, then you're not gonna feel like you know you being attached to one. Huh? Ain't that like polygamy? No, no, no. It's oh. meaning like when I'm cheating, she oh. want me to be like cheat with two girls together. Gotcha. Gotcha. Meaning like do a threesome. That way nobody catching, no just gotcha. ain't catching feelings. You know, but we're in a very crazy era where, you know, entertainers catching all these trouble, all cases, you know, getting people you're not comfortable. You know, it, it might be women out there that purposely out there looking for cases. There are right. chicks out, fellas, be careful. There are women out there looking for cases. If you have any, if a man has any history of doing anything bad to a woman and that a, a woman will purposely come out, go after you, and because you have a history, you will always be, you easily be found guilty, you know? So be careful. And because of that, I don't want to just like picking up new chicks every time. I'd rather just stick with like four or five that I'm familiar with that I know well and then I trust, you know? So we, we have, we still debating to today. So what's the protocol when a side chick asks you for some money? It's a turn. When a girl asks me some money, it's a turn off to me. <clears throat> Big turn off. My, me, you know, if, if I'm with somebody, you know, you should like almost feel and know when they need something or whatever. It, it's, it's, you know, and I, I prefer a working woman, a hardworking woman, you know, mm -hmm. but, um, but I don't, I'm the, I'm a, I'm the type, you know, birthday, Christmas, stuff like that. I'll gifts. I like to give, I give. And I, you know, sometimes if I, I could sense, you know, when a woman needs something, and I'd be like, you know what, uh, just this for you. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, when it, sometimes when chicks are, are baggers, they they back early, you know, right. or they just try to do certain things on purpose just to like be, give the opportunity to back. And a lot of time, you know, all pussy ain't good pussy. Some women just trying to give you the pussy because they want to have the opportunity to beg you for money. Right. You know, and when you've been around for a while and you fucked a lot of women and you did three, you get to sense that. Sometimes I know this bitch is going to give me some pussy because she want to hit me up tomorrow and be like, oh, my rent is due. So you, up, you, that pussy you got to turn down. Now, not now. this is not just you, but if you were looking for <clears throat> a certain type of side chick, what are some 
do's and don'ts for looking for a side chick? Uh, I mean, I want, you know, a quiet one, no loud chick. I always want to, you know, go take a picture in my crib. You know you're in my crib. You know you put this picture up, my lady going to see it. She's going to be like, wow. And my, my crib in L.A. is like, it's like a landmine. You know, it's certain things in there that people know and familiar with. So you don't come in there taking pictures and posting it, and people don't know you're in my house. And, you know, sometimes they just do that be spiteful. Right. You know, so just like a low-key, low-key woman is important. What, what about kids? Oh, yeah. I, don't, I mean, I have kids. I don't never judge anyone with kids. Kids, you know, I love kids. I love children. You know, but I'm, 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 I'm if it's a such, I'm not about to be stepfather. You know, I, mean? I, was, I was supposed to say, have you ever had to buy like a PS5 or some Jordans or some? Yeah, you know what? I've, I've had, um, I mean, I would. If I ever met the kid, you know, and I, I'll do some shit like that. But I, I mean, I don't recall that happening in the last few years. Have you ever been invited to a P. Diddy party? Never. No. <laughs> 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 no, I never been to P. Diddy party. Would you have went? <laughs> uh, I mean, you go to a party, that don't mean you have to participate in whatever's going on. If you go to a party, here's my thing, you know what I mean? Amy Meek said it the other day. Like, you know, it's from freak niggas in Hollywood that we know are freak niggas, and they're doing freaky shit, and you know. <laughs> when I go, when I, if I'm going anywhere close to them freaky niggas, my homies are with me, or my ladies with me. You know, I mean, I'm not, I don't want to be put in no uncomfortable situation, you know, period. And Meek said that too. He said, yeah, when he goes to his band party, he goes with his homies or with him. You know, people else are with him. So, you know, because you don't want to be put into no situ uncomfortable situation, right. period. Now, uh, that made me think of a tweet you had where you said, a nigga jacking off on the plane talking about his mental health, you just a freaky ass nigga. <laughs> <laughs> He said, Who is that? Who's that rapper? Uh, designer. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Being a, he choking said, his chicken on the plant. You ain't shit, my nigga. <laughs> then you said, you know, in America, it's mental health. In Africa, it's the devil. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what they blame? Like, all their, like everything they do that bad in Africa on the devil? Um, I mean, we just find it to be really, you know, America is a very open country mm -hmm. where people right. are just free to do shit. You know, I mean, I'm sure back home people do things too, but everything is done really privately, secretly. You know, even like even recently, where you know, gay is very open in America. You, you know, you marry man could marry man, woman could marry man. You know, man could marry a, a chicken or dog. Y'all could do whatever y'all want in this country. You know, mm -hmm. but you know, certain part of Africa, you know, you, it's illegal. You know, so if it's illegal, just keep the shit in your privacy of your own home. You know, don't. If you go certain countries, you go out, man holding another man hand, he will get arrested. So, us things that we find to be different or whatever, you know, you keep that privately. You you had another tweet that was funny that you said, uh, "Tell me what celebrity, and I'll tell you what part of Africa you think." Oh, they, from. Where, where did you go? Right? Oh, <laughs> and then, and then where the party from? Okay, go and ahead. then you said, uh, "Diddy's from Nigeria," <laughs> and I'm Nigerian, so I was like, "God, <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute." <laughs> so, what what is it like uh, in Africa? You know. Is there a certain, because you're from Ghana, right? Ghana, Liberia, yeah, I rap kind of those, those two countries. Right, so is there a certain thing where y'all clown different countries in Africa, like stuff like that? Or? Mm. Uh, uh, let me see. I mean, you know, the, I think we all, every African, you know, most of us look, you would look, kind of look at us and tell what part we are from. You know, by the way we look, um, you know, the way we talk, the food, you know. So, I mean, certain things, um, I just know, like, you know, I spent some time in Nigeria as a kid, you know, and I know a lot of Nigerian dudes, and I know a few, you know, and I met, I said Didi going to Nigeria because I think of all those places, all the different Africans that I know, I think Nigerians to me are more like on it more freakier side <laughs> of things. That's why I said Didi going on the Didi Nigerian. Yeah. You know. So while we're on the subject, I I'm albino. I have albinism. And I have heard a lot of things about like what happens to people with albinism mm -hmm. when they go to Africa. And I'm just curious to know, is is that factual about some of the things that they say? Well, I, you know what? They're albinos in Africa. 
We have them too. We have our bond. But now here's the weird, here's the crazy thing about America. Like things have in the past, whatever this new millennium we're in, you know, the new two thousands, whatever. You know, um, things have changed in Africa since like in the near in the, in the recently. But prior, when I was there as a kid in the eighties and the nineties. We didn't see colors. We didn't see, look, we could all be from the same country, like especially Liberia. So Liberia is where I spent most of my African life. And Liberia, if you don't know much about Africa, Liberia um, means liberation. Capital is Monrovia, which was named after the President Monroe. So when slaves became free back in what, 1800s, whatever it was, 1890 something, and most of them went to Liberia, like 7,000 of them went to Liberia. So they went to Liberia and those people were considered conquer people because they, they weren't natives, they didn't have a tribe, you know, so they spoke like English and they were the intelligent ones, they were the smart ones. So if you do your history to Liberia, um, you know, because they were the smarter ones, they were the um, pres. They, be, they wouldn't want our president, you know, the, there were black American presidents of Liberia back in the 1890 something because they were educated ones compared to the native, the local ones who didn't, they spoke their own dialect, they didn't, you know. And then those, a lot of those who came be mixed in with white people, you know, because a lot of rape happened during slavery. So then we had a lot of light skinned people in Liberia, you know. And then you got the locals who are a little bit dark, but not as dark as Ghanaians or like people from Mali or Sudan. You know, so Liberia, you could see all this complexion in Liberia, every one of us. And I never saw, we never saw complexion. We never looked at dark and light, you know. We knew Albino was a little bit on the lighter side, you know, but there was no jokes. I don't remember <laughs> jokes as a kid, you know, there. I don't remember, I don't remember no complexion jokes at all. We never saw color. I didn't see color till I came to the States. You know, and I'm like 14 years old, I'm outside, I'm in Newark, New Jersey at this time, hanging out with some kids outside playing. They're like, you black? I said, yeah, we are all black. They said, no, nigga, you black as shit. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when I started, I'm like, okay. And so now they have me self-conscious about my complexion. And that's something I never heard, you know. So it made, and then now I saw, I go out and I see another darker person and he, the mother's like, nah, you blacker than me, motherfucker. So I'm like, the 80s, that was like late 80s, that was like Prince era, Michael Jackson era, you know, era was like, it was hard being dark, you know, and it, it took a while to like, you know, till when dark skin people be, started becoming famous is when we kind of like came out of the woodwork, you know. Big Eddie Kane came out, I'm like, okay, can I come out and play now? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and then, uh, and then Wesley Snipes, oh my God, we playing again. <laughs> and then Flipper Flay came out, oh God, let me back in. Oh God. <laughs> Yeah, but we never saw those things, man. America, when I came to America, I felt like I just, it, you know, and if, you, if you're biblical, you read it, the Bible, it says, you know, Adam, they didn't see shit that they ate the apple. When you saw the apple, you started seeing shit you're not supposed to see. And that's what America was like. I got to America, I'm like, damn, this is the apple. Y'all niggas see everything. You know, like wow. see complexion, and see fat, and see skinny. In Africa, fat was good. Because you're fat, that means you ate every day. You was a rich nigga. <laughs> I came to America, I thought every fat person was rich. My guy was like, God damn. <laughs> All the fat niggas, you eat every day, my nigga, you are rich. <laughs> so All the skinny niggas, you are cracker, you are broke. <laughs> you know, but so much shit America showed you, man. Yeah. And I wasn't ready for it. I was ready, I was, I was homesick, man. I was ready to get the fuck out of this bitch. So, <laughs> so is that really a thing where it's like this thing where, like, where black people and Africans and they feel like Africa? Black people are inferior to Africans, is that really? You know, I hear that a lot, man. Um, and I heard that a lot. And a lot of that came from those who came here from Africa and the way they were treated. You know what I mean? The way they were clowned, especially you come in. Whether you go to, you know, a lot of, lot of time, a lot of the kids might get a scholarship to come to college in America. And they come and they go to school and they get roasted and clowned. So then they give them a sour taste in their mouth, you know. But these are just... It, kids, teenagers, they just do it. American, American, that's what they do here. They roast and make fun of people. And because of that, you know, um, they felt, it was a little thing between why blacks felt like Africans are like them or we think we are better than them. Man, that's bullshit. Let me tell you right, you guys go to Ghana or anywhere in Africa, you're going to be treated like royalty, man. Women go there, 
I mean, I have some, I go to Ghana every other month. I build a free school in my village, so I go there and check up oh, on the wow. school. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, Come on now. Wow. I go to Ghana, I go to Africa every other month. Like I, you know, I purposely got my schedule that way where I take a week of every month. Right. And one week I take a vacation, the other week I go to go back home. And um, and I took a lot of my female friends there and they go out there, they go out, these guys treat them out. It's, Americans are treated like kings and queens out there. So you, if you haven't been home, go home, you all gonna be treated Why do you like think there's that disconnect? Because you know, like- With, Honestly, man, he's a white man. That's why I got, that's the only way I could blame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fortunate. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> then, you know, because they're probably afraid that if you guys really went and enjoy Africa, they feel like every successful black people pack up and move. And America is, is great because of us, because of everybody that come from different places. You know what I'm saying? Right. So if, if, if LeBron James and every great person we have moved there, they, you know what I mean? So I mean, all layups in the basketball games. All layups and all three-point shooters, no dunkers, no nothing. But and it's you know, and they try to make they try to make Africa seem like a bad place. Whoever is doing this, try to make it seem bad. And you know, and if you go there, you see like, what is this Africa? I'll show you my house. My house Africa is better than my house here in America. You know what I'm saying? And they they won't show you that because they won't never want you to think that it's great over there. Right. You know, they want to keep. But yeah, it's Nigeria. Some of the richest people are from Nigeria. Now I got I got to ask you a question on that because I send money back to my dad in Nigeria, and I, I feel like he might be scamming me. How much is too much to send back? Well, I mean the cost of living, and you know, the thing about the, the only reason I'm even able, one of the main reasons I was able to go out there and build a school and, and pay for everything, like I pay for the teachers, I pay security, I pay for lunch, I pay for their uniform, books, everything, you know. And, and and it's like it's a fraction of my income, you know what I'm saying? Because you know my mother is an evangelist, and uh, she brought me up in the church life, and you know um, I grew up giving me ten percent of your income to church, and church to me is a business. I you know I went to church for so long, and I'm you know now when I grew up and I got older, I'm like okay, this is a business. You know if I'm supposed to give ten percent, as long as I give my ten percent, it's a different way. I'm giving it out, you know and. And cost of living, you know, uh, or police and teachers and, I mean, they ain't making much. Between Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, teachers and cops ain't making more than $200 a month. So if you have, you have pop, what that nigga do for a living? Nothing. If you send that nigga $200 a month, that's good enough. You know what I mean? Unless he's trying to, I mean, if you need a home, you probably got, you know, you got Go get a home, and then after you get my home, like yo, dog, two hundred dollars a month is enough to feed you. (laughs) You know what I mean? Unless you got a bunch of bitches. Oh hell no, (laughs) (laughs) nigga. Doctors ain't making that much. (laughs) So yeah, two hundred dollars a month, two fifty max. You you should live a good life. Man, I knew I knew Africa was a a a great place when I seen Hush Puppy. This (laughs) nigga. He's in jail in, in Dubai somewhere, right? Where's he at? Where they got it? I think he's in Dubai. Yeah. yeah. Um, when you begin to go back and go home, like, uh, and rebuild, did you like, man, fuck, I ain't going back. Like, I'm going to just, like, like Akon, for instance, like, he built his community, different things. Like, he just, or is this just a funct- a part of the function of your job? Like, you say you go back every month. Well, like, yeah, I mean, I... I'm, I at the end of the right now, my income is here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And I, till I find a way to make money there, whether it's like, you know, oil or, the, or jewelry or whatever it is that we have, the resources that we have that, you know, other people are taking advantage of and we are not. You know, I'm st- I go out there and I still do my research. I'm still meeting the people trying to figure right. out how I can make the kind of money I make here, there. Till then, you know, I got to come up here and make my money. I got to give the government his part, you know. And then I got, you know, just <clears throat> every chance I get, that I send a little bit of money home, mm-hmm. and because I'm not sure what's going on here, and I, you know, I keep some shit over there too. For sure. But right now, America is just. If trust me, if I could go on, if I could live at home and fly to work every day, I'll do it. Yeah. It's just, just too much. What's the What's the difference? Um, would you say between Africa and America that you see? Well, it's. I mean, we definitely have more opportunities here. Over there, it's like, you know, here you have like. 
middle class, rich people. And back there it's like poor and rich. Ain't no middle. And the middle class is what keep America going, believe it or not. This, you know, they and back then it's like, you know, if you if you have nothing, you're gonna be looked down as nothing. Mm-hmm. You know, it's that's a bad thing. Compared to America, you can be homeless and be a millionaire if you put your mind to the right thing. And, and America has the opportunity, you know. And I'm I'm gonna tell you right now, I don't care what hood you from, where poor you from, there is no excuse living in America. There's none. You know, I came here in this country with my mother. We lived in shelter homes. My mother at one point worked at McDonald's, made fifty dollars a week. You know, we came from nothing and I found a way. And if it wasn't stand up, trust me, you know, at teenage years I worked at Domino's Pizza. If I wasn't doing stand up, I right now would have probably owned me like five, six Domino's Pizza and still make millions of dollars. So America you can find a way. You can be a landscaper, find out how you own a landscaping company. <clears throat> You know, you work at McDonald's and find out you can own a McDonald's. You know, so there is no excuse. So then, and, now mm-hmm. I have to ask: Do you, when you hear other black people talking about like, bro, there's no opportunities for us out yeah, here? Yeah, so I, I don't. You, I'm like, not falling for it. <laughs> you don't care what projects you live in, where you at. You know, you can make it out of there. It starts at school. Start listening to your teacher. You know, stay off the streets. You know, you got you got it's choices you make. And I grew up in Southwest Philly, the hood of Philly. You know, and I had to like, I, you know, I decided I'm going to work, could make me five, six dollars an hour because I could have easily joined the drug dealers and, and well, I'm not sure where I'll be, probably not be alive right now. You know, so it's a decision we make and we make this decision at a, at a young age. And I know it's peer pressure, you know, it's tough out there and you just got to find your way. You got to find a way to make the right decision. At 14, 15 years old, that's decision time in your life. Amen. Do you have a side chick in Africa? Oh yeah, I got. It. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, and then, I got and, then I, and then uh, what do you do when they try to come back to America? Well, you, it says the thing too, man. You you can't just come up and come to America. <laughs> America is the hardest place for a black man outside of America to come to. People don't understand. Europeans get visa. You know, they don't even need visa. You from England? You from France? You could just go online, do something. You come here for a few days. Man, they're not laying no Jamaicans in or no Africans. You can't just do that. You have, they want America want to know why you coming here, how long you going to be here, and when the fuck you going back. <laughs> <laughs> and they got to feel comfortable. They got to know. They got to feel like they know you're going to go back to your country. You know what I'm saying? Um... If it let, like a guy like you, let's say you 25 years old, you live in Ghana, you like, I'm gonna come to America. You go to the embassy, like, for what? What you come here for? Uh, um, come, no, nigga, denied. <laughs> like, you, they gotta make sure, you know, I mean, if you have, if you come in, if student visa is possible, you know, but like, you say, I'm just coming to visit. Visit who? How? Who? What are you living back on? How we know you're coming back? Mm-hmm. We need to see your bank account. You know, if you leave in like millions of dollars, okay, you might come back. You have a wife and kids, okay, you might come back. You got no wife, no kids, you got $10 in the bank, nigga, you ain't coming back. <laughs> denied. 90% of people that try to come to here that are black from parts of Africa gets denied. That's fucked up. So it ain't easy for you. you I can't just go, I bring... You know, I got a 30-year-old chick up there. Oh, come on. She, they ain't going to let her come. They got to they gotta know that she's going to really go back. So it's hard. It ain't easy. I bet she be like, I'm really going to send her back. So <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I got a question. Um, I, was gotta, I, I mean, gotta, unless, unless you go out there and marry a person, you go marry a person, then you go file for papers for them. You know, America respects marriages and all of that stuff. I was going to say, again, when I went to your uh, comedy special, you was firing everybody up, right? Has there ever been a point where a nigga tried to come up and run up on you on stage? Has that ever happened? Uh, it depends. You know, sometimes, I mean, I got to, sometimes comedians, we do go too far. You know, <laughs> I mean. That was, my, that was my question. Sometimes we do. I mean, you say a joke here and there, okay, boom, it's over with. But if you just on one person all night and going, it depends what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Men, we have ego. You know, especially if you're talking about his lady, you're going in and really hard. I never, I've never had, you know, 
No, because I've been doing it so long, I kind of like know my limits. I know how far to go when a nigga's getting serious. You know, when you got to know, you got to be intelligent at this. You got to know when to cut shit off. Right. You got to know how to make them laugh again. You know, my thing, if I'm going to roast you, if you're not laughing, I'm not comfortable. You know what I'm saying? You know, I got to make sure the nigga I'm making fun of laugh too. Because if not, I'm like, okay, well, this nigga ain't laughing. <laughs> <laughs> what, hey, bartender, give me a drink. <laughs> On me, motherfucker. You, you don't know, come back there with a gun and shoot up my fucking show because you pissed off. You know, but I, I, I don't remember, um, you know, like I said, maybe early in my career when I didn't know how to control it. I remember way back in like early 90s. <laughs> <laughs> I was on stage and was doing the Dennis Rodman era, and there was this one lady, she was in the front with blonde hair, and I called her Denise Rodman, or some shit like that. Because then Rodman had the blonde hair, and she just poured a drink on me. I'm like, okay, good night, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do when the drink is on your fucking face. But you know, that was pretty much that. But now it's like, I, I kind of take control of how I roast people. You know, I'm not gonna go in there and call them by, you know. I'm not going to degrade nobody. It's going to be jokes that's obvious that we all see. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you're fat, everybody sees you that you're fat. <laughs> <laughs> you knew the fat joke was coming when you came and sat in the front row with that size 14 T shirt, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> you got a big ass head, you bald head, you're going to get it. If you look like somebody, if I peep that, you're going to get it. <laughs> I rose the obvious, motherfucker. Now, one of the things... To harken back to that Cat Williams interview, he said something about you using a fake, not yeah. a fake he African said a, accent. He said you're a real African with a fake, fake. accent. <laughs> I said, nigga, use a fake pimp with a real perm, bitch. <laughs> so, you know, the thing about Cat, he's never, he's never been to Africa. We don't know what every, there's so many different countries, you don't know what each African was to speak like. Right, right. We don't. We don't know how. You know, Liberians people speak differently. Ghanaians speak different. Nigerian, Mali, we are all different. You cannot tell me how I'm supposed to speak or what's, what a real accent should look like. You've never been to Africa. Right. You know, he just, like I said, he kept was mad at me. He was, fun, he was putting everything together he could do to torture my ass. You know, and the, the, the only, the one of the crazy thing he said that was such a big lie, you know, but he wanted to attach himself to something positive. Like, you know, he was... His interview, he roasts people and he tried to make himself look so good. He said, when I go to a, every city I go to, I make sure I leave 10% of my money, whatever he said. Yeah, on drugs, motherfucker. You, the drug dealer. 10%. <laughs> you make 100 grand, you spend $10,000 on drugs, motherfucker. That's not leaving money for your, your, this city. You know. Um, then he said, uh, he, um, if you consider yourself the African king of comedy, he said, he said he had to talk with me. Me and this nigga never had no conversation. <laughs> yeah. He said, you know, I told him, if he, you call yourself the African comedy, go to Africa and build a school. Nigga, who the fuck randomly tell their friends go build a school? <laughs> That's not me telling this fat nigga go build a gym. <laughs> this shit make no sense. But you know what? Building a school is something that is almost impossible to do. Right. And he, you know, who did it? Fucking LeBron James, Oprah. Yeah. How many black boys have done it? So now I've done something so great, right. he had to find a way to attach himself to it yeah. and tell him that he told me to do it. Yeah. Oh, so wow. that way he could look good. Cat, he's a crackhead. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that means a certain thing. I mean, the jokes are all good when you start lying, you know yeah. what I mean? And the thing about it, he, <laughs> he said some true shit, a couple of true shit he so, probably said. So the Hollywood part, right, mm -hmm. where he, you know, they... They allude to the whole wearing the dresses. It's a lot of yeah. weird stuff going. Is there any truth to that in your opinion? Uh, I don't know. Not you know the dress thing to me. You know it's like it. It's not as serious to me. Here's the reason. You know, if you think you go back to like sixties and seventies and fifties, even go to Jamaica, you know, Africa back then, before we were brilliant enough, right, to come up with great material, we had to look funny. So if an ugly nigga like me put a dress on high heels, I look for you gonna laugh at me. So it's more of a visual thing. And they did that. That's what the comedians did back in the 60s and 70s. You know, a man put a dress on, it's funny, and then people laugh. It was more like a visual. Right. You know, and in Hollywood, I guess I never, I never really took that personal if somebody wore a dress. I don't think it meant anything. It just looked funny. You know, say, I don't think it's too much. They're taking it too far. I don't think it's that big of a deal. Now, there are other things that make you do. 
on movie sets. We've seen it. I'm not going to mention no movies or names or actors or whatever, but we've seen it. There have been movies where they make niggas' lips touch each other. Oh, what? Plenty of movies. What? Hold on. What? Plenty of movies. I, ain't wanna, I don't want to get into it. You talking about like off camera? No, oh, on camera. On camera. Oh, shit. There are a few movies where they make, they made as an excuse to make these men touch lips. That's the thing that bothers me. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like putting a dress on and, and shit. You just something. Um, that day is what makes me say, okay, they, 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 they trying to do something to you. Right. Or you sign up for something. Yeah. Is there a certain movie role that you would not do? Yeah, I won't do no. Uh, what's it? One of my favorite movies is Pulp Fiction. <laughs> right, more that scene where <laughs> Vin yeah. Rains got fucked in the ass. He ain't anybody doing that. <laughs> you know, fortunately for a nigga like me and like Cat and uh, Eddie Griffin, D- D- we are comedians first, right? We make our money from comedy. You know what I mean? This is if 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 Hollywood saying ain't ever gonna put me in a TV show, or give me a movie, I don't give a fuck. I make good money going to telling jokes to my fans, niggas that love me and trust me and believe in me. They going I get my money from y'all. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So if nothing happens, I will always have these people as long as I, you know. So with Hollywood, you know that act. There's some people that are just actors. Mm-hmm. That's their bread and butter. They don't only go, if they ain't acting, they ain't gonna eat. You know. So I'm not sure what they have to do to keep their jobs and do all that shit, you know what I'm saying? But like just certain people, when they just get to certain levels, I'm like, why are you doing that? You didn't have, you have millions of dollars. Why are you gonna let them niggas do that to you? Why are you gonna make them, make you do this scene in a movie? Why would you let somebody fucking ass in a movie? You, you know you, what I mean? Now, you think like, part of it be like the desperation as far as because you know, the wages we feel like actors certain really make, they're not really getting like, like for instance, Taraji P Henson, she was like, "We're there. We're not making this money. I think we're we're getting like so. It's like these roles are what keep us alive. Like you think it part some of it might be like the struggle, like just try to stay relevant. Yeah, it's a combination of trying to stay relevant mm-hmm. and hoping if you do you do us, you're gonna do this one big movie. You know, you might have to like take a little bit of money and do this movie because this movie might change your life. You know, what I mean, this movie might be the the one after that might be where they will finally show you some respect. Mm-hmm. You know, like when she did, um, she did, what's that movie, Benjamin Buttons, we figured like anything after that, they should really respect this lady. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Cause that movie made millions of dollars. So what you gotta do in, in you know, and I'm not sure how much power these people have to like, hey, you know, if they don't wanna pay you a lot of money up front and you think the movie will do well, just try to get a back end deal. Like, hey, you know, okay, that's fine. I take this little chump shape, but can I get like 5% in the back end? You know, um, but like I said, a lot of these actors, man, that's the only livelihood, you know. Is is there a movie that came out that you feel like you should have been in? Like maybe Black Panther? Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely Black Panther. Black Panther. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. T'Challa. <laughs> yeah, I think every movie, every movie needs a comic relief. I don't care how serious the movie is, how much this, you want to part where you want to, you need a laugh. I think Black Panther. I think they should have called me. Right. You know, nah, for sure. <laughs> nah, for sure. Who Who are the comedians that you feel like stand up comedy wise are the best? Alive or dead? What do you mean? Like, Don't matter. Right now, like from beginning to the end. Let me see my top ten. Top ten alive and dead. Okay. So when I came to America, I just missed. I missed the Richard Pryor era. Mm. You know what I mean? And, uh, and I, I ran, it was the Eddie Murphy era when I walked in. So I like, you know, saw Delirious and Raw. And Delirious and Raw, that shit is like motherfucking 40 years old. Delirious is like 40 years old. I think Raw was like 87, 88, so not quite. But Delirious and Raw are still relevant today. You can watch it and still, hey, and still laugh. You know what I mean? Everything he talked about, even a lot of people he roasted, we, we know them now. And it was 40 years later. You know, so I put, you know, and then of course, Belly Hill Cops and Eddie was just the man. So I put Eddie at, you know, number one to me. Put Eddie at number one. And then I got to learn about Richard Pryor, you know, and then I, you know, and, and I think they say he was a goat of all times. So I put, Ed, I put him at number two. 
Uh, you know, I think Bernie Mac, just his life was so short. I think it was, it was so much we could have got from this guy. You know, he died at 50. 50 is like the prime of your, as a comedian, it's the prime of your life. Because at 50 years old, you've been doing comedy. Comedy is something you start in your early 20s. So you're like a veteran. You know, as you get older, you get wiser, you get better, you get tougher. And I think we just, we didn't get enough of Bernie. So I put Bernie in like three. You know, then we're going to go to like, uh, um, let me see. Who? Oh. I love Chris Rock and I love Dave Chappelle, but while I like, you know, Dave, you know, turned down that fifty million dollars because, you know, there was a certain things they wanted him to do on the show that he wasn't comfortable with, and I respected that, respected him for that. You know, even though I was, and I was very mad when he didn't do that season because I, when he was doing a promo for that that season, he never did. I did a promo. I was I was a comedian. I was paid to do a promo on that show with him. So I did a, a little promo sketch with Dave on that season that pussy came out that he, he decided not to do. So I was pissed. I know. You know what I mean? I was pissed about that. But I, what what I like best about people is like you know to be thrown out and for you to come back and fight. You know what I mean? He turned out fifty million, but like now what? You get twenty million dollars every time you do a special. You know what I mean? So I respect Dave for that. So I think Dave is like number four. Because I'll debate me to him and Chris Rock because I love Chris Rock. I think Chris Rock is so brilliant. I always liked him from like, um, I'm going to get you sucker. That was, you know, he was like the king of cameo. That was, that was like probably the top cameo scene in the movie. And I think when I did my cameo, I think I became number one cameo in the movie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't get jiggy with this shit. Yeah. Where's your manager? That pink motherfucker. <laughs> you look like that player hit out with so many shit. I'm not there receipt. Kiss my ass so what? Please don't hit me. I'm just a bitch ass nigga. <laughs> so I put Chris Rock at number five, right? And then let me see who else after that. Oh my god, what are the comedians? That's that's my top five. That's cool. We we'll take we'll take, we'll take five. the top five. Yeah, right, top yeah, five. Let's go there. <laughs> Is there a difference between comedy club funny and social media funny? Oh yeah. You know, um, and a lot of those, lot of those social media guys that, you know, they get a little funny, one minute skit, and you know, and they 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 did try some try comedy, and it was it was not easy, not easy at all. The the bomb on stage just struggled, you know, and then some guys just found a way to like go to the comedy clubs and work out material. Like DC Young Fly, he was on the first one. Started off on social media, roasting people, build a fan base. And then started going to open mic night, and now DC has developed into a real comedian. You know, uh, Jesse Larry, same thing, De- developed into a comedian. B. Simone developed into a comedian. Desi Banks is doing his thing. You know, Haha Davis, he's still, you know, figuring it out. Yeah. Um, Do you think T.I. is funny? You know, I'm, T.I. is so legendary, man. You know, and he got so much confidence in himself. He feel like he could do anything. And I got to give him props for that. Mm-hmm. You know, I was there the night he got booed in New York. You know what I'm saying? And for him to, like, bounce back and still, you know, um, he got a lot to talk about. He got, you know, he and he has potential. You know what I mean? I haven't seen him lately, you know, but I heard he's been doing his thing. So I got to see him again. Because now it's like, okay, you guys been like three years now. In three years, it's, it's like when you should like really f- have it figured out by then. So I have to see. I haven't seen him lately. I got to see him re- like now to, de- to kind of like judge him or determine how well he's how, doing. How much would you charge him for some coaching lessons? Charge you? T.I. How much would I charge him? Oh, ch- T.I. I don't want to be on it. T.I. I think he's, he's, he already know it. <laughs> yeah, T.I. ain't taking no advice from nobody. Because when, you know, when, when he started... We was like, T, okay, you starting this. This is what you do. That's my advice to him. You know what I mean? I was like, you got to host the show, T. You can't be the headliner in a comedy show. <laughs> you know what I mean? You cannot. But he, he was headlining. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I was like, T, I, host, I said, host the show. I said, host the show. In between hosting, play your music. You're a legend. You got hits. See, I like, fuck that nigga, I'm a headliner. <laughs> you know? So I gotta see him do his thing. I'm not sure. I'm not, I haven't seen him in a while. It's been like 
probably a year since I saw him perform. So we got a big fight coming up. You got Jake Paul and Mike Tyson. Who you got? Uh, uh, I'm sick. Of, I'm tired of seeing Mike Tyson boxing in his damn underwear. Man. Yeah. <laughs> Jake Paul, knock his ass out. I'm just playing. <laughs> Punch him in the nuts. I'm just playing, man. Um, who I got? Uh, it's probably one of them fights gonna be all set up, man. I, 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 I'm not sure it's gonna be a real fight, man. I'm not sure it's gonna be a real fight. You know, I, I, I watched the Tyson when he fought. Um, what's his first one? Is it? It wasn't Roy, was it? Yeah, 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 Roy, yeah Roy Jones. Roy. Yeah, yeah, Roy yeah. Jones. It was a draw, I think. Yeah, man. Niggas in the fifties, man. They ain't yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a wild concept. They're not hitting that hard no more. I mean, Tyson would knock me the fuck out, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he would knock my ass out. Right now, they just fighting for the money. They don't like yeah. <laughs> Man. <laughs> oh, man, I've been watching a lot of BMF. And I'm just curious, did you ever run across... BMF just during your time of doing, you know, comedy? BMF. Okay. BMF, uh, Meech, Terry, the uh, the notorious drug dealers that they got. Black Mafia. Black Mafia oh, the real ones? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, 50 I, I, Cent got the I, show. <laughs> <laughs> he said the real ones. I don't recall. I know, I mean, one thing, gangsters are, gangsters are big, they love comedy. Right. Real gangsters love comedy. And I remember when I was in Philly, I think this one lady that promoted a show, she used to date a BMF member. Mm -hmm. I think he passed away or something. But that's all I remember. I don't, I don't really I don't really know them that much. I don't know them that well. But they're comedy fans. Yeah. <laughs> Should black people be buying shoe, Trump's tennis shoes? You buy what? Should black people be buying Trump's tennis shoes? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you buy. <laughs> Listen, man, if you like shoes, buy whatever you want. Man. Yeah. Shoes is shoes. Yeah, man. Because I guess you figure out if you're buying it, you're supporting him. Is that why you look at it? For sure. You know, he's just trying to pay his little $355 million debt. You know what I mean? That's what that is. He's trying to raise money. I don't care. Yeah. I mean, I. Y'all laughing. He's going to be about to win. <laughs> Do, so. Uh, I know you're saying like in your country you're, you know you're building. Do you think you would ever get into politics? On that side, uh, yeah, of things? I would. I, I could see myself later because I'm passionate mm -hmm. about stuff, you know. And I've been, I've been around, I've been around the world, and I know what's best for what, you know. I'm a, and I'm, I'm more for the kids, man. I think the mm -hmm. future starts with the children. You know what I mean? It's, you know, they don't really. A lot of time, they don't really. People don't care, so yeah, Africa don't care much about the poor. And I came from a poor, you know what I mean? So I know what it's like to like come from nothing and become something. And I know what I know what these people need, you know what I mean? And I know what these African leaders do, you know, and I won't be most of them. I'm not gonna say all of them, you know, but they most of the time they just go in there just to like get the money and be out. I don't give a fuck right. about the people. And I care about the people. So and and that's what a real leader is, I man. You gotta really really love the people. Hey man, is it hard to take Cam Newton seriously when he wear them hats? <laughs> man, that's his style, man. You know, I dress crazy too, so I can't be judging no other crazy dressing nigga, man. <laughs> Poor Cam, man. He got jumped by them kids. <laughs> Bro. <laughs> nigga, I got to go. Your down. time is up. <laughs> Y'all got like one minute, motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> so you better think about the most so, important so, question. So, so, nah. <laughs> So I mean, let, let's talk about man. What you got coming up? What's oh, Michael Blackson? Appreciate Blackson's? that. Um, what I got coming up? All right. So you know, I made some promises to myself. You know, I've been like, you know, besides going on the road and touring, I've been lazy with certain things I I wanted to do. You know, I mean, last year I did accomplish my mission of getting a TV show. You know, Tyler Perry Studio gave me a show. We shot like four episodes of the Michael Blackson show. So if you haven't seen it yet, go on BT Plus, watch it. So those are pilot. What pilot is a show? It's like a showcase. Right. You shoot it, people like it, they shoot, they shoot more. I'm very hard on myself. And when I did that show, I watched the show, I'm like, this shit's funny as fuck. You know what I mean? So everybody go watch it, you know, hit up Tyler Perry Studio. Hey, we need some more of this back. Okay. Uh, that was my 2023 um, mission that I had accomplished and I did it. So now I'm just waiting for them, like, let's go shoot some more. I'll be ready to go. Uh, for 2024, I'm gonna, I definitely gotta put a special out. You know what I'm saying? I've been depriving my fans of a special. 
you know, and I also got to put out my own movie. There you go. So, yeah, so those are my goals. But besides that, I'm touring the whole freaking country, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm back in Texas April 18th to the 21st. I'll be in Houston. That's wild. And then just go, um, just follow me on IG at Michael Blackson. For those who went to a public school, it's M I C H A E L B L A C K S O N. You and 50 are cool. You ever going to be in one of his series? Uh, now nah, we talked about, you know, they, me, I'm more of like, I like to, I like shit that has to do with me. I like to do my own show. You know, if we're going to do a movie, I got an idea for a movie, let the movie be about, let me, you know, it's easier to do things when you write the script yourself. I don't want to be cameo or nobody's shit no more. I want to start my own shit. So me, if we talk about a few things, he, he want to fuck with me. That's my dog. Amen. Man, we just want to thank you so much for coming and sitting down with us. You are a legendary uh, funny motherfucker, man. And I appreciate that. He's like, bro, we, the words can't express, man. Oh, when you're back in Texas, if you're ever back in Dallas, come fuck with us, man. Definitely, it's man. The best I had part. a good time, man. Hey, and it's the best part. Michael Blackson, you are a real life street star. <laughs>